Okay, welcome everybody. This is Marty. In this video, we're going to discuss best practices for digital twins using AI and BIM 2.0 tools. This is going to be a backgrounder for the two videos that we're doing tomorrow where we get into the conceptual design tools, but we wanted to give you a bit of the background on what's happening in the AI and BIM space because it's a fast moving target and uh, we've, we've done a lot of very recent research in order to show you um, what you can take advantage of. So we'll, we'll just do first a little brief recap of um, BIM 1.0 versus 2.0, uh, what we call the general arrangement tools, some deep dive into recent AI and ML developments, and then some best practices, or practically speaking, what you can do with what you have now. In the fall challenge, we talked a little bit very briefly about the history of BIM and how moving from uh, CAD, which was lines, arcs, and circles, the metaphor of a drafting table on a computer, to the metaphor of a cardboard model in a computer that you could cut and turn into plan section elevations and all your drawings as an instrument of service for an architect. And that was the idea of what we now call BIM 1.0, and um, namely Revit and the other BIM tools that are out there. So I like this definition that Parametric Monkey had uh, talking about BIM 1.0 and what it what it the promise was. And there was basically two promises. The first was, as I've highlighted, synchronized plans and elevations, synchronized scheduling, um, basically all of the grief of coordinating hundreds of different AutoCAD files as you made changes to design were gotten rid of so that as you made a change to that cardboard model, all of the drawings were updated so that you didn't have to go and catch all those. Uh, the second was, as you can see in the inset uh, down here, is the promise of progressive model refinement. So you would start with concept um, in Revit. We put in the massing tools. You get into the early design, eventually get into design development, eventually end up at CDs, but that you could progress the model uh, from one stage to the next as you had conversations with the client. In the collaborative early stages when you really need to get feedback with the client, it's, it's more problematic in a file-based workflow like Revit has. And so that's part of why BIM.2.0 is um, coming, coming to play in the cloud. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I agree with what Parametric Monkey says about the drive to BIM 2.0, and that is what you found with BIM 1.0 is that you had standardization around objects. So you have, you know, building smart and the IFC standard eventually turning into a runtime interface where you could exchange data in a standardized way between platforms. But that's standardizing around data and essentially artifacts of files that you exchange or upload somewhere. Uh, BIM 2.0 is really about systematization and it's how I take a process which is different every time and potentially craft-based and come up with ways of systematizing it so that I can cut out time and I can get to the same result faster than I would the old-fashioned way even if I was using standard components. So we'll talk more about that as we get into what these tools are and what they do. Uh, but just keep that in mind um, from this definition. And I think the other thing about BIM 2.0 is that BIM 1.0 is pretty much assuming a waterfall practice going from conceptual design to design development to construction drawings. Um, and, in, and like everything else, it has become more agile. So part of systematizing is so that you can make it more agile so that uh, you produce a result, you get things in the, uh, by systematizing it that allow you to make predictable outcomes from previous decisions. If you have to go revisit those decisions, then systematizing it then gives you new outcomes which are predictable so that you can go back and, and change things without paying the cost of then having to redo everything manually from that point forward and losing all that work. So um, part of what's going on with the the move to the cloud. All right, I know it might be a little abstract, but we'll tighten it down um, as we go forward. So here's the first effect in tightening it down. Around 2017, what I call general arrangement tools in the cloud started coming out. And these were sort of a mashup between uh, GIS or geographic information systems that had mapping data and early conceptual modeling of buildings in say a development that was spanning more than one lot. And you found that 
uh, developers that had inventory uh, with lots of land, especially in urban areas, were either developing these tools themselves, partnering with companies that could develop them. Um, and so you find that you had different um, startup companies doing this, some big companies doing this. The, the one in the upper right here is Google Delve, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. But you find they all have the same theme. You start with a map, you identify where the project's going to be. Then you either through interactive tools or through AI come up with a whole bunch of options uh, for the owner to consider largely through financial metrics of their pro forma. Um, Autodesk eventually bought this tool you see in the upper left called SpaceMaker. Um, and then, you know, it produces some data which is okay when you're looking at it from a conceptual standpoint and solving the pro forma, but nothing an architect is going to be able to use to actually get buildings drawn you also find that some large firms uh, like Perkins and Will uh, have their own attempts, Massformer in this case, uh, which was um, part of a, uh, a webcast on the use of the Forge API. Um, and then even large developers like Lendlease, which made a whole system called Podium, uh, which was very similar in all these things where you had uh, metrics driving option variations of, of massing on a site and then looking at it from comparing performas and uh, trying to analyze site feasibility more from the developer's standpoint and the finance entity's standpoint than, say, an architect's standpoint. Uh, but those were some attempts, you know, that I call the general arrangement tools. And that is a, that is a theme, that um, doing a mashup between the context of a project at the concept level is something that um, was a theme that has gotten even more attention. And there are others than this, you know, there were many other entrants, Archistar, TestFit, Paraffin. There are lots and lots of different versions of this concept. And we'll talk a little bit about these. And some of these claimed to use AI, so Delve, SpaceMaker, you have Hypar, you have Swap. These all claim the use of AI, um, how much and how they use it. I haven't really gone into <laughs> too much uh, delving other than to talk to some of the founders of some of these companies. Then you have what I call the procedural tools. And these would be Schema, Snaptrude, Shapes, and Podium. And you know we will actually go through and show you some of these tools tomorrow. We're going to talk about the ones that use AI today. Uh, in particular, um, let's we'll start with, I believe, Delve. All right. So... If you see what's happening on the screen and you're looking at Delve, you can see that it really starts from a finance point of view. Um, yes, it's some amount of uses and program, but you're putting in targets that are based on, uh, you know, a developer's uh, mindset. And then you're asking AI to do solves of massing that might, you know, satisfy those targets um, where Proform is driving a lot of it. And that was really the idea behind it was that, you know, this is a developer's tool. And in fact, in the promotional videos for Delve, you know, they would say, you work with one of our designers. So I always envision it as competing with architects uh, for serving a property developer and um, a different way to get to a project outcome. Now you may, you know, use this and work with an architect eventually to do the real building. But the idea of having, you know, these jello cubes, you know, in this case, potentially hundreds of variants to evaluate. So whether that's better, it remains to be seen. You're hearing my opinion on what I think is uh, necessarily good or bad. Next one would be swap. Um, I'm going to just speak over it. But the idea here is that many of these things work the same way. They start with a map. You define your site and then you get into some massing. Now, for what Swap does, it appears that it has some layouts, some pre built facades, and you choose how many of its layouts of a certain type you want, and then it generates a building for you. So it is a sort of similar to, in my view, uh, Delve, in that you fill out, you know, some aspects of a, how many of each type of unit you want. Um, and then it does a solve to determine uh, what the building will look like. And it can potentially do 
lots of variants um, to give you different options of the building configuration. It's generally the same, uh, very similar workflow to Delve in that you're filling in, you know, entries. Um, some of the tools we're going to show you tomorrow uh, can be more of a drawing based or interactive process uh, where the architect is using massing as opposed to filling out a form. But pretty much, you know, it's this mashup of context in a mapping environment combined with a building mass and um, some sorts of metrics for say an architect and a developer to to review things together and then potentially some simulation um, that allows the architect to evaluate the design from different constraints and this, this is pretty common from from what's out there i found this which i thought was a pretty interesting look at how the architectural design process flows in this case, I really liked the way that this person looked at preliminary sketching. And so if we zoom in on that bubble, uh, you can see the three use cases that they define for how you would use AI in the schematic design phase. And those are site assessment, schematic floor plans, and look and feel conversations. So tomorrow, I'm gonna get into more of a deep dive on site assessment and schematic floor plans. Right now, we're gonna go into how you can use some of these tools for look and feel conversations. And we are gonna start with Midjourney. So as we mentioned in the intro, uh, Midjourney is a diffusion AI based on physics that deals with images. And I'm gonna show you how it works. The two best diffusion AIs that I've had luck with are Dolly and Midjourney, and I've had much better luck with Midjourney than with Dolly. So I'm gonna just do a brief intro on how to use Midjourney. It is uh, implemented as a Discord bot. So first off, you need a Discord account to be able to use it. And then what I've done is I've created my own server um, for, for my art projects. And in this case, I've created a channel. So you can create a, ch a channel here that I've called, you know, Project for Apartment Buildings. And um, then you enter a prompt by which Midjourney will uh, create uh, an apartment building uh, rendering for you. So the way that this is done is you invite Midjourney to your Discord server, and you can only do that by paying for a Midjourney account. There used to be free Midjourney accounts, and they've shut that down because they had too many people signing up for free accounts. So now you can only do paid Midjourney accounts, and I will refer you to YouTube videos on how you actually get a paid Midjourney account, I'm sure. They even have videos on how you invite the server. But assuming you've been able to do all that, here's what it looks like to actually use Midjourney inside of Discord. This is pretty much how Midjourney works. You, you type in a command, imagine. When you hit space, it'll ask you for the prompt. And then you, um, you know, put in a, a second story view of a four to five apartment building in modern exterior. Let's see what that does. Hopefully it'll give me a different perspective on it. I'll pause the video and come back to it. And as you can see, it progressively refines the images. So you can't, you know, you can only kind of tell what it's going to look like as it's doing it. You really won't know until it gets to 100%. So now it's done and, well, I can't say I really like any of these. <laughs> uh, I kind of like the images that we did earlier. Uh, so let's go back and show you some of those. Um, in this case, I've put in the prompt an aerial view of a four to five story apartment building with modern exterior with a couple little um, switches to give me 16 by nine format images. Uh, I liked um, number two the way it was, so I told it to upscale that. So this is just a thumbnail when I tell it to if you click this U2, then it will upscale that. And I told it to make me some variations of this number one and this number four. So the images are one, two, three, and four in that order. Um, so what that will do is it will automatically then launch commands to do that. So when I clicked variation of one, it started doing the variations of, as you can see, image number one up there. And then it started doing the variations of image number four and so if I like one of these, let's say I like this one with this interesting little balcony thing here, I might say upscale number one. So if I click U1, it will then launch a job to upscale that. Um, 
and that will be at the bottom of this channel. So I'll scroll down there in a minute and you'll see it. And I might say, you know, maybe upscale this one, which is three, or I could say make me variations on any of these. Uh, so that will give me a couple bird's eye views that you'll see down here. Now when I upscale this, you'll see it had some artifacts. So if I open that up, it'll give you a higher res view of it. And this is what happens with these AIs. Sometimes they don't do a good job and it, you, it, you really can't fix it. It just gives you unpredictable results sometimes, depending on what prompt you use, what image it made, and then what you decided to do with it, whether you decided to do a variation. In this scale, I just, in this case, I decided to do what some, some call a light upscale redo. Um, as you can see when I go and show it to you, it didn't help. Um, this was another one that I upscaled, so this was the result of image number one. This is pretty interesting. You know, I could have a conversation with a client about finishes or the feel of, of a building that they were thinking about. Um, now, this was that redo. Again, it didn't really fix it. So sometimes you just can't, you know, sometimes you can't use what it gives you and just that's just how it goes. So then instead of doing an aerial, this when you say aerial, it'll give you this top, you know, isometric sky view thing. I changed that to be a street level view of a four to five story apartment building. Um, and then decided to upscale you know, a couple of these. Number one, so this is the upscale of number one. So you can see that. Um, and then, you know, that does a pretty good job. I could have a conversation around this. All right, now as you saw, uh, mid-journey can be somewhat unpredictable. So a tool I think is actually really useful um, that's free to download and try is uh, something from Evolve Lab called Verus. I think a lot of people are using this. Basically, you can get started with very little data in Revit and then apply the same type of prompt that you would have in mid-journey uh, and it will give you way more control over the output so that you get output that is very presentable to a client so that you can have conversations about materiality or, or the feel of the project. And tomorrow I'm actually gonna show you how to do this uh, using some of the conceptual tools and how to take some of the very early massing data from those conceptual tools into Verus to produce some of these images. So uh, we'll just leave you with that teaser um, and we will see you in the uh, challenge tomorrow where we'll get into some of the conceptual design tools and how you can use what you have today to get started with them.